Hello, my name is and I'm going to discuss the ventricular system. So basically, the remember we have the node that was inducing the overlying um, ectoderm to form a neural pleat, then a groove will form at the center, and then the sides will elevate and form neural folds that come together and form a neural tube as they release neural crest cells. So the walls of this neural tube form uh, the brain on the upper two thirds and the spinal cord, while the cavity of two thirds is what will form the ventricular system, and the cavity of the neural tube within the lower form the central canal of the cord. So, the remnant of the canal of the embryonic um, neural tube is what forms the ventricular system, and it's usually lined by ependymal cells, parts of the cerebrum, with the holes, while connected um, to the unpaired third ventricle in the diencephalon. So we have lateral ventricles in the cerebral hemispheres and the diencephalon will go and this to the third ventricle via the interventricular force, the fourth ventricle by the cerebral aqueduct. So cerebral aqueduct is located in the brain, brain, the upper portion is on the um, pons, while the lower portion is on the medulla. So the fourth ventricle then communicates with the subarachnoid space through uh, Two paired uh, through two lateral foramen of Lushka and a single median foramen of Dengue. And um, the CSF or within the spinal cord is contained within the basic that's those are the components of the ventricular system. So you have your lateral ventricle here, and you it has an anterior horn, it has a um, posterior horn. Okay, so this is the antrum. So anterior horn, posterior horn, inferior horn, and the antrum, those are the parts of the lateral ventricle. Now the lateral ventricle contains CSF, it communicates, it's it, the lateral ventricle is on the cerebrum, cerebral hemispheres, both right and left. So you have two lateral ventricles. Then you have one third ventricle within the diencephalon. So CSF leaves the lateral ventricle through the interventricular foramen of Monroe to the third ventricle in the diencephalon. Then CSF will later follow the cerebral aqueducts okay which is within the midbrain to enter into the fourth ventricle that's located on the pons and the posterior aspect of the pons and the medulla then from the fourth ventricle csf continues downwards into the central um, canal of the spinal cord but it can also exit through two foramina of lushka and one foramen of majendi which is not shown in this um, image so again this is your frontal horn the central part Okay, that's the occipital horn and the temporal horn, of, and that's the antrum of the lateral ventricles, and you have two. And then this is your choroid plexus within the lateral ventricle and in the roof of the third ventricle. So choroid plexus is on the floor of the lateral ventricle and the roof of the uh, third ventricle. CSF from lateral ventricle enters third ventricle through interventricular foramen of Monroe, from third to fourth through cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia's, then from fourth into central canal of spinal cord. Again, remember we had three primary vesicles, prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhombencephalon. They will give us five secondary vesicles. From prosencephalon, you have telencephalon and diencephalon. Telencephalon gave us the cerebral hemispheres with its cavities, which are the lateral ventricles. The diencephalon give us the diencephalon derivatives, including the thalamus, and the cavity of the third ventricle is the, the, ca the cavity of the diencephalon is the third ventricle. Then mesencephalon gives us the mesencephalon as a secondary vesicle, gives us the midbrain and the cerebral aqueduct as the cavity. Then rhombencephalon gives us mesencephalon containing pons and cerebellum, which will give us the upper portion of the fourth ventricle, and the myelencephalon that will give us the medulla, and the cavity of the myencephalon is the lower portion of the fourth ventricle. So these is what we are talking about, the lateral ventricles from the telencephalon, the third ventricle from the diencephalon, mesencephalon giving us the aqueduct, and the rhombocephalon, and the rhombocephalon giving us the fourth ventricle. So um, basically, because we'll ask you about the primary boundary brain vesicles and the derivatives from the wall and the cavity of the neural, of the vesicles. So, this is what we are going to discuss about absorption of reabsorption of CSF. Remember, this is our falx cerebri, and this is um, if you're to look from here, this is your dural venous sinus. Okay, your superior sagittal sinus is located here. So this is your outer part of the dura mater and the inner part of the dura mater. This is your subarachnoid space. Remember, this is your uh, the pia mater. This is your arachnoid mater. So this blue is your subarachnoid space containing the arteries. So this is subarachnoid space, okay, where CSF is. So CSF will be reabsorbed through arachnoid granulations and empty into the superior sagittal sinus. This whole place is the superior sagittal sinus. So this is pia mater, 
this is arachnoid, so this is subarachnoid space containing CSF and the arteries, and CSF will be reabsorbed at the arachnoid granulation. Okay, these are arachnoid villi that are at the superior sagittal sinus. So the fourth, the lateral ventricle has four parts. There's of course a central part which is the body. You have a frontal horn. Okay, then you have a posterior horn, which is the occipital horn, and a temporal horn, which is the inferior horn, and then you have a collateral trigon there. Okay, and the lateral ventricle communicates with the third ventricle through the interventricular foramina of Monroe. What are the positions and relations of the lateral ventricle? Now, remember, it's, it comes from the telencephalon, the canal in the telencephalon. So, what are the relations of the body, okay, of the lateral ventricle? Above it, we have corpus callosum. So, we are talking about the body of the lateral ventricle. It's around here. So above it, of course, this is the corpus callosum. Okay. Then the flow is formed by the thalamus and caudate. So the thalamus is here. So the lateral ventricle is here. So the flow is formed by the thalamus and caudate at this level. The medial wall is formed by septum pellucidum. So septum pellucidum is what separates right from left. Um, this is septum pellucidum, is what separates the right, it, septum pellucidum runs from corpus callosum to the phonics, so it separates the right from the left um, lateral ventricles. Then the anterior medial wall has choroid uh, plexus or choroid fissure. Then the anterior horn, what are the relations? The forward extension of the body into the frontal lobe forms the anterior horn, and it's usually devoid of choroid plexus. So anterior horn is devoid of choroid plexus, and of course medial to it is also the septum pellucidum. So the anterior, anterior horn is on this side. Okay. So the, the inferior horn, which is the temporal horn, is where the body of lateral ventricle now extends inferolaterally anterior towards the amygdaloid complex. So the flow of this lateral ventricle is the tail of codid while its lateral wall is formed by hippocampal and superior medially is a choroid fissure with choroid plexus. Then the posterior one of the lateral ventricle usually extends posteriorly into the occipital lobe. It does not contain any choroid plexus. So, so far we have seen that choroid plexus are in the inferior horn and the body. Okay, inferior horn and the body. Anterior and posterior horns are devoid of choroid plexus. Then the triangular area where the body, temporal horn, and occipital horn meet, that's where the collateral trigon is found. Then we go to the third ventricle, which is a uh, cavity of the diencephalon. It's related to the thalamus and hypothalamus, which are also from the diencephalon. And um, as other structures bud off from the diencephalon, usually they carry the canal with them forming recesses. So third ventricle extending with the structures of the diencephalon, you form what you call the recesses. Then we have choroid plexus in the lateral ventricle extending into the roof of the third ventricle through the interventricular foramen of Monroe. Then we have intercathesion. This is what connects the right to the left thalamus. Usually this interthalamic adhesion interrupts the lumen of the third ventricle. Okay, so these are your lateral ventricles, right and left, separated by the septum pellucidum. This is your corpus callosum here. Through interventricular foramen of Monroe, the two drain into the third ventricle here. So this is your thalamus on each side. And then the third ventricle drains into the aqueducts into the fourth ventricle. So what are the relations of the third ventricle? Lateral to it, of course, thalamus above and hypothalamus below. Then the anterior wall, of the third ventricle is formed by lamina terminalis and the rostrum of corpus callosum and anterior commissure, while the roof of the third ventricle at this level will be formed by the phonix. The posterior wall is formed by the tegmentum of the midbrain. So those are the relations. So this is your third ventricle. We said you have choroid plexus on its roof, okay, and you can see the phonix again on the upper portion. The thalamus and hypothalamus are lateral to it thalamus and hypothalamus so this is your third ventricle and it communicates with the lateral ventricle through interventricular foramen of Monroe. again the third ventricle and we say it as structures are budding from the diencephalon they go with part of the of the third ventricle and those are what you call recesses so following the pineal gland that's your pineal recess your suprapineal recess you have your supraoptic recess infundibular recess so as structures are developing from um, the diencephalon, they go with it with part of the canal of the third ventricle and these extensions of the third ventricles around the structures are recesses and they contain CSF. Then the third ventricle is interrupted at the center by interthalamic adhesion. This is what connects the right thalamus to the left thalamus. So again, this is your lateral ventricle there, this is your third ventricle, the aqueduct, then 
um, coming to the fourth ventricle and central canal of the spinal cord. The fourth ventricle is rhomboid in shape and is located on the lower end of the pons and upper part of the medulla. Usually it represents the neural canal within the rhombencephalon. So what are the boundaries of the fourth ventricle? The lateral walls are formed by cerebellar peduncles. So laterally, cerebellar peduncles. The roof, this is the roof. You have this and this. This is your, the pink is the floor. So the roof is formed by two medullary villum. So you have the cerebellum plus two medullary villum. You have a superior medullary villum and an inferior medullary villum. Then the floor is formed by the dorsal part of the pons, the lower part of pons, and the upper part of the medulla. So these are the boundaries of the fourth ventricle. Medullary villa form the roof, the lower part of pons, upper part of the dorsum of the medulla form the floor. Okay, and laterally you have the cerebral pedicles. Again, the superior and inferior medullary villa form the roof, then the lower part of pons. Upper part of medulla on the dorsum aspect from the, 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 the floor and the peduncles will be on um, the lateral aspect. So which structures are found on the floor of the fourth ventricle? So this is how the floor of the fourth ventricle looks like. So as you can see here, there is usually a midline structure, a mid, medial sulcus here. And then just uh, uh, it's divided, it's rhomboid in shape, remember? Then you divide it into two halves by a midline, a medial sulcus and then divide it into upper and lower portion by this, which you call the stria medullaris. So the upper triangle, just after the medial sulcus, you have your medial eminence. Then after the medial eminence, you have sulcus limitans, this sulcus here that separates it from this lateral aspect. Then below the stria medullaris, again, from the medial sulcus, you have the hypoglossal trigone with hypoglossal nuclei. And then below it, you have the vagal trigone with the vagal nuclei. So what are the structures on the floor of the fourth ventricle? So you have what you call uh, um, nucleus of abducens nerve with facial nerve looping around it, forming the facial collicula. So that's the first structure on the floor of the fourth ventricle. Number one, facial collicula. What forms facial collicula? It is formed by the nuclei of abducens nerve with the facial nerve going around it. Facial nerve going around the nucleus of abducens nerve forms the facial collicula. The second structure on the floor of the uh, fourth ventricle is the vagal trigone containing vagus nuclei, then hypoglossal trigone containing the hypoglossal nerve nuclei, then we also have nuclear vestibulocochlear nerve at the side here, and the floor is usually crossed by stria medullaris. So those you should be able to draw this cross section. You draw rhomboid, separate into two triangles by stria medullaris, separate into two halves by a median sulcus. Then you have your facial collicula here, then vestibular nuclei at the side. Then you have a hypoglossal trigone here. Below it, you have the vagal trigone. So, next uh, video, we shall discuss cerebrospinal fluid.